Hi, welcome to APP to APP Virtual Lectures. I'm Sarah Wolfson. I have been a geriatric nurse practitioner uh, here in Omaha, Nebraska for about 12 years. Um, I've been in nursing for uh, way longer than that. Um, so this slide is about difficult conversations, having those conversations with patients and families that have to do with the patient's serious illness, their conversations that we as providers know we need to have, but we have a lot of qualms about doing them. So the objectives, and I, and I hope that this will you know, give some ideas and help people feel a little bit more comfortable. So the objectives identify reasons for why these conversations are difficult and, and complicated, develop a framework for thinking about how to structure uh, the conversations, and describe several key skills to approach the conversations with honesty and compassion at the same time. It sounds like a kind of a tall order. So what do we call a difficult conversation? You know, this is also known as a serious illness communication, and it's also been called a high quality conversation. So it goes on between a health provider and a patient, usually when there's a, it's a time of transition, it's a pivotal time for the patient along their trajectory of illness. It helps to establish uh, goals of care, and it needs to encompass all the facets, psychological, physical, and social, like social determinants of health that we've, we've all heard about. And it's a means for establishing some realistic goals, but not necessarily taking away the hope from the patient and significant others or family. So what keeps us from having these discussions earlier on than we typically do? So number one, you know, we worry about taking away hope. If I talk to somebody about their serious illness and we talk about a prognosis and where they're headed, they're, they're just gonna lose all, all hope. Um, uncertainty about the specific illness, you know, some people don't always follow the normal trajectory. As we say in geriatrics, it's always an atypical presentation. So we're never completely sure. We also uh, don't tend to do prognosis very well. So there's uncertainty about how the patient and family will respond to bad news. You know, are they going to get upset? Are they going to want more information? Are they going to slam the door completely? And there's uncertainty about who owns the conversation with the patient and family, who is in control, patient, clinician, or I'll read more like partners. So there are reasons why these discussions don't always go well, and I have blown a few uh, on my own. So our emotions and our instincts are very strong, and it may work against us. Uh, we're not really sure always where to start, how to word things, how to begin the conversation, how do we end the conversation. We don't want to aggravate the patient. We don't want the patient to get upset. We don't want to blow the trust that there may be between ourselves and the patient. And again, we don't want to take away hope from the patient, give them a little something that they can hang on to. So this causes us to avoid the conversation or we handle them badly when we do initiate the conversations. And especially when we really, you know, we are really able to have these conversations and we can handle them much better than we think we will. So this is what a patient expects from a provider. We all have our expectations. So the patient wants us to figure out what it is and fix it. But if you can't fix it, I want you to be truthful with me and tell me what, what the story really is. Listen to me, listen to what I'm, I'm telling you in my, in my history, get to know me as a person, you know, ask questions about me, you know, for our geriatric patients, it's what did you do for a living? How long have you and your spouse been married? Things like that. Ask me what's important to me. I want you to know what's really important. It's my family, it's my grandkids, it's attending someone's graduation, things like that. Give me your best recommendations, but understand if I decline to follow them. This is, this is a big deal, you know, it happens a lot where we give them these recommendations and we do a lot of research and stuff and there's a lot of good evidence behind them, but a lot of times the patient says, you know, I, I really don't wanna do that. And, and we, have to, we have to go along with that. 
do always do your best as a provider and remember that we need to work together as a team. We are partners. So this is a little graphic I got from uh, a palliative care uh, physician that I work with. And it's a pendulum that swings back and forth. So this is how people cope with serious illness. On the one hand, we might have some fear. You know, what we thought was going to happen may not happen. I'm really scared. On the other side is another extreme of hope. You know, my hopes are being realized. I'm so, I'm so pleased. And somewhere in the middle is reality, which is what's really going on. And it's a little bit of fear, maybe a little bit of hope, but the pendulum can swing back and forth depending upon where the patient is in that illness trajectory and what's going on at the time. So um, Atul Gawande, um, I don't know if you guys have read his stuff in the New Yorker, but he put out this book called Being Mortal. And it had to do with some experiences of being a physician at a hospital in, in Boston. And it's really his personal story about how we can better live with uh, frailty, serious illness, and when we are sitting facing death. And it's it's a pretty it's a pretty quick read. And if you guys haven't read it, I really highly recommend it because he has a lot of very good things to say. Um, we talk about uh, as part of serious illness discussion, and again, even though I'm in geriatrics, you know, this can apply to anybody at any age who has a serious chronic illness. So part of the discussion has to do with goals of care, which incorporates advanced care planning. So advanced care planning is what do I want for my care as we progress? What do I want my healthcare providers to know about me? And generally it's the physician, APP, whoever who initiates this discussion. So it can be more overwhelming if it's done for a patient who's no longer able to make healthcare decisions. And so a lot of times we could be talking about somebody with dementia, we're talking about somebody with long COVID, maybe they have a lot of brain fog. The earlier you can kind of initiate the conversation when a person can make decisions, the better. Get an idea of an individual's preferences when the planning can be done together before there is a crisis. And a lot of people go from crisis to crisis and somewhere in between, it's important to start that conversation. So starting the conversations early improves outcomes. It helps make sure that the care is aligned with the patient's goals. This is a moving target. It changes as the illness trajectory changes. So even if somebody um, delineates their advanced care planning, this is what I want, this is what I don't want, they may change their minds when they finally do get into a serious situation. So it's, it, it's, it's a window into the present, but it can always change. Just planting the seed is a good start. You take the necessary time to allow the individual to become comfortable with the idea of stating their wishes. And so you may just get the conversation started, but not really accomplishments, but that's okay because you're giving the patient something to think about, and also they will initiate discussion with their family or significant other, which is really important. So uh, it's not just healthcare, it's financial management, it's end of life care. So don't ever expect that one conversation is gonna be thorough enough. And go back to it regularly, um, update it if there's changes. You know, when we do our wellness visits and geriatrics, we, we update that at least once a year. If there's a change of health status, you update it. Um, if a husband is a power of attorney for his wife, but he develops dementia, another person needs to be given that role instead. And those are the things that we have to initiate because people are not necessarily going to think of this because they're so busy in the midst of whatever they've got that's going on. So there's this debate um, about advanced care planning. Does it really help palliative care and end of life care? So the controversies are about how good is advanced care planning? Does it really do what we want it to do? Um, there are some articles talking about what's wrong with advanced care planning. And one of those is what I had mentioned before, which has to do with it's a moving target and um, what a person says today, you know, in six weeks when they're in the ICU, they may change their mind. 
So the idea is, in some of these articles, is should we maybe shift to what we call a serious illness communication? And maybe we need a new paradigm. So there are experts and people out there that are weighing in that maybe something like a serious illness communication seems to sound better than just advanced care planning. So really, it's about what's the best way we can help our patients deal with this goals of care, serious illness, because it's really tough for them. We want to have quality in our discussions with patients, but we still want them to think ahead to when they're sicker. We want you to envision two years from now or a year from now when things get worse. We want you to envision when your husband who's taking care of you winds up in the hospital with pneumonia, what's your backup plan, those kinds of things. The patients struggle uh, with what's, what are the options? How do I know what I want at the time? How do I know what I'm going to want in a year? And the provider struggles with, does our discussion affect the care that this patient gets from me? This is um, a graphic that was in the American uh, uh American Geriatric Society Journal, and it was uh, done by Alex Smith, who uh, is one of the two docs that runs a podcast called Jerry Pal, which is a really good podcast about geriatrics and palliative care, but a lot of the stuff they deal with crosses all um, age ranges. So this is about um, areas of overlap between advanced care planning and serious illness conversations. And you can see, you know, I don't need to go over the whole figure, but you can see where there are similarities like understanding values, goals, and preferences. And you can see where advanced care planning, healthy or stable, chronic illness versus serious illness, which is acute illness, or you're decompensated, you're having a flare up. It was just a graphic done to point out the, the, the controversy. So uh, why, why do we wanna go with serious illness communication? Um, you know, as, as we shift to having multiple conversations across this illness journey or trajectory over a long period of time, uh, we need to remember the focus is really about the process itself, the conversation. So building and refining and making the decision-making better from diagnosis on through end of life. It's supporting patients, accompanying them on their illness journey, um, and helping them to accept a prognosis that's tailored to their preferences. And we're not talking about resigning themselves. We're talking about accepting and helping them cope and learn how to live with their illness and how to get through the flare-ups that pop up every now and then. But there's a different way to think about prognosis than what we normally think about when we, when we hear the word prognosis. It, it's more broad than that. We, we don't really want to focus on how much time there is. We want to focus on function. What's the, the, the patient able to do? Do they have to have help to get to the bathroom, to dress, to prepare a meal? Do they need help standing up from the chair? Do they need help using the toilet? This is really important information. It's very important to patients because it's day-to-day -day stuff. And it's very important to the significant others who, many of whom are informal caregivers for, for their loved ones. So this is a functional prognosis rather than a time-based prognosis. And it's much more patient-centered, which in turn makes it a lot easier for the provider to talk about, because we're not talking about time, because as I said, we're lousy with trying to figure how much time does a patient have left, but it's much easier to deal with how can I help them to function as best as they can day to day. So that's really huge. So this is uh, something that was put out by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, which does a lot of different things. This is the conversation project and you can go on their website and get more information about it. They've got a lot of tools. So it's helping people share their wishes for care all along that trajectory from diagnosis to end of life. Now we have some strategies as clinicians or providers um, and I'll go through these um, separately. So there's ask, tell, ask. There's spikes which is a tool for delivering bad news. And each letter of the word spike stands for a different part of the conversation. The nurse tool, there's a serious illness communications checklist and a conversation guide that goes with the checklist. And then we have vital talk, which is a talking map 
There's also an app called um, Vital Talk or Vital Tips that you can download on your phone, which also gives information for how to handle these conversation strategies and things like that. So the Ask, Tell, Ask has been around for a really long time. Um, so it's asking, I'm hearing you have a lot of questions about your prognosis, telling you disclose as a clinician the prognostic information that the patient wishes to know at this time and not more than at this time. And did my response help to answer your question? There's also spikes and spikes can be used in conjunction with ask, tell, ask. So spikes is S is for setup. That has to do with your surroundings. Make sure your surroundings are really amenable to having this kind of a discussion. You're not gonna do it at the busy nurses station or, um, or in the patient's semi-private room. Perception, ask open-minded questions to see what the patient's perception is. Of what do you understand about your current medical situation? You got to know, you got to find out what it is the patient knows before you can continue on. Invitation is find out how much information the patient wants to receive and discuss right now. It's in the present and we don't want to give them more information than they're really ready to absorb. So knowledge is giving that information to the patient and then you check back for understanding. Do, does that make sense? Do you understand? Do I need to explain more? Empathy respond to the patient in a way that acknowledges the strong emotions they're feeling and reassures the patient that these feelings are normal. You know, you're feeling exactly the way you know, people in this situation have felt. Summary and strategy, determine whether the patient's ready to discuss more, you know, the next few steps of what, what we need to do next. When they're ready, you know, check for the understanding, let them ask questions, discuss treatment goals and strategies, but, but always check for understanding. And of course, is there anything that scares you? Tell me what it is that concerns you about this particular treatment that I'm offering you. The nurse tool, um, it has more to do with empathy. It's also been around for a while. Um, observing the patient's emotion, you know, I see that you're upset. I see that you're angry, um, legitimizing the patient's emotions. You know, I under, I can hear what you're saying. Um, praise or acknowledge the patient's work, you know, and any time with patients when they've, when they've done work in general, we need to praise them. Boy, you did a really, a really good job doing all that research. And I, you know, I just can't believe how, gr how good of a job you've done. Wow. I'm really impressed. Um, supporting the patient to let them know that they're not alone. You're standing with them and with the family for the same thing because they get scared too and they feel very alone. Exploring is ask the patient to elaborate more on your feelings. Tell me more, I see that you're angry. Tell me more about that. What's going through your mind right now? So again, these are all very patient-centered kinds of things. So uh, the reason these conversations, again, are really important about the serious illness is because, you know, talking about the future is not going to change the care that the patient's getting now. Um, it's not going to change plans that you've made for treatment unless, you know, the patient wants to change those. And so, again, we always strive to do the best possible care for the patient. Suggest that the patient bring other people to their next appointment. It's always good to have somebody else there to make sure that everybody heard the same thing. Sometimes the significant other or the friend has questions and things that are on their mind that they would like answered. Um, you know, ask your patient to bring someone who preferably is their substitute, you know, would be their power of attorney or their decision maker if they couldn't. And a lot of times, you know, there could be several people that want to come in uh, to be part of the conversation. And then, you know, understand that the patient's wishes may change over time. So you, are, you once said you wanted this, and now you're saying you don't want this. So you have to, you know, understand that they go through a situation where they process and sometimes they make peace with something and then realize that that's not something they really want. They change their mind. So, you know, the future is always a concern for people. What's going to happen in the future? <clears throat> always support them. Let them know that you will continue to be there for them. This is um, 
from um, actually the um, Nova Scotia Health Library. And um, at the bottom is um, a website. There's this very short video. It's about three minutes with a tool, Gawande. And I tried to insert it here, but it, it didn't work. And it's a very simple talk about um, these four things that we need to cover in these conversations. So, you know, Atul Gawande again emphasizes the importance of asking patients questions about hopes and fears. Don't press them. I got to have a decision now. I got to know what you're doing. Um, so these four parts of talking, and he, he outlined for terminally ill patients, but, you know, it really goes for everybody. Does the patient know their prognosis? Do they really understand the condition that they have and, some, and the ramifications? What are their hopes and fears about what is to come? We find this a lot, you know, with dementia, what's going to happen down the line. And sometimes it's a, that's a hard question to answer. What are their goals? What do they want to do as time runs short? What do they want to do if they know that they're going to get more and more immobile? What kinds of things do they want to get done now that would make them happy? What are the trade-offs they're willing to make? How much suffering or pain are they willing to go through for the sake of the possibility of added time, which has to do more with end-of-life care? So I, you know, if you want to watch it, it's very short, very short little video. He's a really, he's a really good speaker. This is a serious Ill, uh, illness conversation guide and um, Ariadne Labs, um, and along with Harvard um, School of Medicine, have done a lot of things with serious illness and put out conversation guides and patient tools and things like that. And it has um, very similarity to a lot of the stuff like spikes and everything. And um, on the right hand side, uh, the form has patient tested language because you don't want to talk over the patient's head and you don't want to use a lot of medical jargon. Um, and when they talked about, you know, in general, when you want to educate a patient, like with a handout or something, write it at like fifth grade level and your talking needs to be the same. It needs to be easily understood and grasped by the patient. So this just gives guidelines. You know, the one on the left, again, talks about some topics to explore. And it also goes into documenting the conversation and then communicating with key uh, clinicians or other providers. Many people have five, six, 10 uh, providers for different disciplines, endocrinology, rheumatology, whatever. And if, if you are the primary, it's really your job to disseminate this information and make sure every other provider knows this because you are the clearinghouse. For that patient. So this is a serious illness conversation guide. It's a little bit more detailed about questions to ask what's your understanding as a patient, um, sharing the prognosis, goals, if your health situation worsens, what, what's most important to you, uh, what are your fears, what abilities are so critical to your life that you can't imagine living without them? And for some people, it could be, you know, I love to cook. I love to bake for my family. And <clears throat> I can't imagine not being able to do that. Um, if you become sicker, how much are you willing to go through for the possibility of, of being able to do that? And then how much does your family know about your priorities and wishes? And some patients don't want their family members to know and we have to respect that. We don't like it, but we have to respect it. At least hopefully we can encourage the patient to let their family and lo uh, loved ones know. Sometimes the family dynamics are very dysfunctional and, and that could also account for someone not wanting their family to know, or they single out, for example, a, a, a parent singles out one child they wanna give the information to, but not the other siblings. So that can be that can be really sticky. This is from uh, Vital Talk, and there's a website there. And again, most of these websites you can click on and you can access all these tools. Um, there's all these communication tools, which are really nice and how to disclose um, serious news. And a lot of them have videos and they have little patient scenarios that you can look at to 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 get some ideas. This one tool that's here that says offer prognostic information, how to balance hope and realism, that's also 
is tricky. And again, even people that have been experts at this for a long time, we can all blow it. And, and it's okay if you blow it. Just don't be hard on yourself because you can always, you can always backtrack it. Okay. When it comes to introducing palliative care, the messaging is important. And I learned this from listening to a podcast with Dr. Beck, who had uh, with another couple of people, they had something called the Message Lab project that they did. And they did focus group and they found that the public has a lot of misconceptions about serious illness about uh, care planning, palliative care, and hospice that goes really, really deep into our society. Um, and it factors into the distrust of healthcare, especially with the COVID pandemic. Um, one of the things he cited was that we always see this logo of folded hands for palliative care and hospice. And he said that that just is completely negative to, to uh, people, and they don't react very well to that. Um, the emphasis is always on death, and it's not on life, and how can I live while I am having to face, you know, end of life. So out of the project came five messaging principles that they found to inform the public, get them to understand serious illness care, and Instead of providing a brochure, here's a fact sheet, this is what palliative care is. The messaging needs to promote more of public engagement. And one of the things too that makes it run so deep is because um, it's how we feel in the society about, about hospice and death versus how they feel, say, in European countries. You know, in European countries, their ICUs are like five beds, whereas ours are like 20. They never have situations really, at least not until COVID, where you've got two patients that need uh, the one bed that's left and what do we do about that? Because they're more accepting of, listen, you know, I've reached that point, you know, it's time to just consider hospice. Whereas we're always in there pitching, pitching, pitching. I got to do everything. I got to do whatever. So that's a societal thing. And it doesn't look like that's going to be changing anytime soon. So these are his five messages. Um, one is to talk up the benefits to show that palliative care improves lives. You know, it's really helpful. It's symptom management and, and we can help you to live better, you know, day by day. Present choices for every step. Um, palliative care and hospice are different product lines and you give people an idea of choices so that they can have more of a sense of control. Use stories that are positive and aspirational instead of, you know, quoting really scary statistics like we always read. Um, you know, this person, we helped this lady uh, to feel better so she could go out and she could sit and watch her grandson play baseball and cheer at his game. You know, talk about that stuff instead of the statistics about how many people are still alive after five years with this diagnosis. Invite dialogue, you know, and do that more than once and get the conversation going so that people don't feel threatened. And then, you know, talk about a, a range of people, clinicians, organizations, you know, palliative care people, bath aids, all kinds of people that can come in and help with support. They can help with transportation, with food, with housing so that it takes care of all the needs of the person. And it will also help the family who has spent a lot of time taking care of this patient and they're starting to get burned down and they would like to spend quality time instead of time having to do chores to take care of the patient. So we also have tools for patients. And again, this is uh, part of the IHI uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement conversation product. This is your for the patient's conversation starter guide. Um, and it's designed to help people get ready to talk to their healthcare team about what's most important to them. Hopefully, you know, some patients will just jump on the bandwagon and initiate the conversations themselves. This is a, a really good thing. This actually has to do with um, more advanced care planning, but it's still part of serious illness. It's called prepareforyourcare.org. And um, it has power of attorney paperwork 
and a way to record your wishes for what you want. And you can either um, go online, the patient can fill it out online, or they can print out the paperwork and then fill it out. Um, it has the paperwork for what's required in all 50 states. In each of the states, you can click on it. It has different languages for the patient to click on if they are Latino, they speak Spanish, it's Spanish and they've got other languages in there. There's videos that people can watch to help them um, understand what's involved in, in coming to decisions about power of attorney and surrogate to decision makers and, and what their wishes are. It's, it's really neat. And it was actually a study that was done by the University of Michigan and it was very well received um, by patients. And this is actually what we use now. Um, our health systems version of advanced care planning booklet is just, it's boring, it's stodgy. Um, this is a little bit not exciting, but you know, the characters they use and the figures on the paper are much more engaging than, than the old stuff. So this is, uh, tells you that prepare for your care has these five steps. Uh, you choose your decision maker, you decide what matters most, um, have some flexibility for your decision maker in terms of, you know, you tell them your wishes, but if A happens, you can do this. If B happens, you know, or consult so-and-so if you're having trouble. Um, tell others about your wishes. The more people that know about your wishes as a patient, um, the easier it will be for the decision maker when the time comes that they have to make a major health decision. And, and it encourages you to ask doctors the right question. This is um, the engagement guide that explains stuff. And then on the right is just there, um, they have what they call movies or which are videos that, um, that you can watch. And then they also have these things where you can get a group of people together and they can have like a movie night where they can watch all the videos and understand a little bit more about the process. A lot more patient friendly. This is another site called Respecting Choices uh, for Patients. Um, for person-centered decision-making. I love that decision-making that transforms, you know, that sounds so, ooh, you know. And then I just learned about this one from um, the um, Geriatric AP um, Association called Patient Priorities for Care. It's also called PPC. Um, and it was actually one of the people that designed it is Mary Tonetti, who's a physician, who's um, a, a very big name in mobility and falls. And she's done a lot of studies on those things. And it's more, you know, it's health priorities. Um, it will give you a, a provider section with tools. It will give a patient section that you can get information to give your patient and that the patient can utilize to help with the conversations. It's real, it's like a really nice website. Um, so it's identifying health priorities, values, outcomes, realistic health outcomes, preferences. Um, it's one thing that the patient most wants to address to help them achieve their health goal. And usually there may be 10 things, but you have to address each one by one, and you can't expect to address all 10 in, in one visit. So you align the care with the patient's health priorities, and then use the patient's priorities as a focus for the communication you have, as the goals that you design with the patient, and to prioritize care decisions um, and treatment decisions. They do have... Um, a patient booklet. And I, I looked at it a little bit, not in great detail, but it, it some of it looked a little bit busy. So sometimes some of these um, patient um, books and things are a little bit too busy and you have to kind of figure whether or not, you know, it will be too overwhelming for the patient. Um, this is just some samples of um, the website, things that they have. We have on the uh, little video uh, clip this is like my standard patient, you know, and this could be anybody. Um, I have a daughter with chronic health conditions. This could be her too. And there's all these different things going on and all these people in her life and her health care. And she's got hip pain and diabetes and she's got gout. And what do we do? And it helps for um, the patient tips for talking with your healthcare team underneath the video. And the video is really good. And they've got some cute little videos on there. And on the right is more for the provider about um, 
it's a template for helping the provider address all the important things that they need that they need to talk about things that we've already that we've already discussed and it's i kind of like the way they they've got things laid out here this is another thing called caring conversations it's from the center for practical bioethics so we have some bioethics organizations that are also uh, invested in trying to help care become more patient centered and again it's more geared towards the patient but it does have some physician and clinician helpful tools as well. So again, you know, it's really about the process. Okay, so from diagnosis to end of life, along the spectrum of care, the trajectory, the patient's health journey, we are there with the patient along the way, we need to provide psychological support to them, but we need to remember it is about the process and about the function and not about how much time the patient has left. This is um, a point that I wanted to make, which is um, to know what your own feelings are before you have the conversation. And um, we can get very attached to a lot of our patients and it's okay to have emotion and it's okay to show it because that helps patients know that we are real people. It promotes the connection, it promotes trust and to show that you have empathy with the patient and that you understand what the patient's going through. And it comes in very handy for conversations where a patient just needs to accept where they're at and to know that there's a lot of things that they need to do and they take up a lot of time, but we're there to help them do those things, even though we can't fix it and make them completely better. So this is a really important point. A lot of um, like med students, especially in people in health are taught that they're not supposed to show emotion, but you know what? The patients really like to see that we're real people. And this is my um, bibliography of all the different stuff I um, had from um, Mel Tepley, who is a palliative care physician, uh, gave me some stuff up from her slides that I was able to incorporate. She really was very helpful in um, websites for all of the other stuff that I chose. So. And that's it. So thank you all and take care.